video is about early electric vehicles. In 1828, the Hungarian priest and physicist Anjos Jedlik invented an early type of electric motor and created a small model car powered by his new motor. Between 1832 and 1839, British inventor Robert Anderson also invented an electric carriage. Various federal agencies in the United States, including the Department of Energy, insist on calling this a crude electric carriage, but it could haul goods and sweep streets, so it wasn't necessarily that crude. In 1835, Professor Strading of Groning in the Netherlands and his assistant, Christopher Becker from Germany, also created a small-scale electric car, powered by non-rechargeable primary cells. A primary cell is a battery that is designed to be used once and discarded and not recharged with electricity and reused like a secondary cell. A major factor reducing the lifetime of primary cells is that they become polarized during use. This means that hydrogen accumulates at the cathode or positively charged um, ode and reduces the effectiveness of the cell. To reduce the effects of polarization in commercial cells and to extend their lives, chemical depolarization is used. That is, an oxidizing agent is added to the cell to oxidize the hydrogen to water. Manganese dioxide is used in the zinc carbon cell and nitric acid is used in the Bunsen cell and Grove cell. Attempts have been made to make simple cells self-depolarizing to add them to the class of batteries by roughening the surface of the copper plate to facilitate the detachment of hydrogen bubbles, but this has been met with little success. Electrochemical depolarization exchanged the hydrogen for a metal, such as copper in the Daniel cell or silver in the silver oxide cell. Scientists addressed this by using rails as conductors of electric current and a patent for this use was granted in England in 1840. Similar patents were issued to Lilly and Colton in the United States in 1847. The first battery rail car was used in 1887 on the Royal Bavarian State Railways. Scotsman Davidson later, later built a larger locomotive called Galvani, and he exhibited it at the Royal Scottish Society of Arts exhibition in 1841. The seven long ton vehicle had two direct drive reluctance motors with fixed electromagnets acting on the iron bars attached to a wooden cylinder on each axle and simple commutators. Galvani hauled a load of six long tons at four miles per hour for a distance of 1.5 miles. It was tested on the Edinburgh and Glasgow Railway in September of the following year, but the limited power from the batteries and its weight prevented its general use. It was destroyed by railway workers who saw it as a threat to the security of employment and no punishment was sought because people understood the value of workers on the railway. The first electric car in the United States was developed in 1890 by William Morrison of Des Moines, Iowa. The vehicle was a six-passenger wagon capable of reaching a speed of 14 miles per hour. It was not until 1895 that consumers began to devote attention to electric vehicles, after A. L. Riker introduced the first electric tricycles to the United States. This was due to a lot of French achievement. In 1880, French inventor Trouvé improved the efficiency of a small electric motor developed by German Siemens and used a recently developed rechargeable battery. Fit he fitted this to an English James Starley tricycle and then invented the world's first electric vehicle which could be charged by the motion of the tricycle. Electric vehicles had a number of advantages over their early 1900s competitors. They did not have the vibration, smell, and noise associated with gasoline cars. They also did not require gear changes. While steam-powered cars also had no gear shifting, they suffered from long startup times to get the steam to get the motor running up to 45 minutes on cold mornings. Electric vehicles were also preferred because they did not require a manual effort to start as did gasoline cars, which featured a hand crank to start the engine. 
Electric cars found popularity among urban customers who used them as city cars with the knowledge that the cars could not go very far. In the United States, by the turn of the century, 40% of all automobiles were powered by steam, 38% by electricity, and the minority, 22%, by gasoline. A total of almost 34,000 electric cars were registered in the United States, and the United States was the country where electric cars had gained the most acceptance. That was this was partly due to infrastructure improvements, with Edison recommending electrical power in every home where cars could be recharged. There was no need for specialty plugs for these electric vehicles. Most early electric vehicles were also ornate carriages, designed in part for upper class customers and women, which made them popular. They featured luxurious inter interiors with American-made fabrics, and were replete with expensive materials, including precious metals. Electric vehicles were often marketed as luxury cars. There were over 300 listed manufacturers who produced a vehicle in the United States until 1942, and so there was incredible diversity of choice. People could choose which car they wanted from over 300 manufacturers who were able to provide specified service to those vehicles. Number one, electrical vehicles are comfortable and not terribly difficult to drive, said Stu Somerville about the 1911 Baker, a volunteer mechanic at the old Rhinebeck Aerodome Museum in upstate New York. This museum holds a 1911 Baker in its eclectic collection. But part of the attraction of the electric automobile was the fact that it did not emit gasoline fumes, you didn't have to crank start the engine, there was no big wheel to wrestle with. It was very smooth handling. You didn't even have a loud offensive horn. There's a dainty little bell to warn of its coming. Ads were frequently, although not exclusively, pitched at women. Baker's first car to market was a two-seater, the Imperial Runabout. Priced at a competitive $850, it was shown in New York at the city's and nation's first auto show. It attracted a number of notable buyers, including Thomas Edison, who purchased one as his very first car. Edison designed the long-lived rechargeable nickel-iron batteries made from American nickel and iron used in some Baker vehicles. By 1906, Baker was briefly the world's top producer of electric vehicles. But like many in the emergent automotive industry, Baker wasn't just in it for the business. He was in it for the speed. As his company was enjoying success in the consumer market, he was pursuing his dream by developing a series of advanced record-setting race cars. His first, the Torpedo, was built in 1902 at great personal expense to Baker. This was a time when the American government was incredibly limited and men such as Baker were not eligible for receiving grants and help from the United States government. With its 11 batteries, 14 horsepower mid-mounted motor, outrageously low slung, 48 inch height, streamlined and lightweight white pine and oil cloth body, and bizarre webbed canvas seat restraints, the torpedo seemed poised to set a world land speed record. Having founded the American Ball Bearing Company in 1895, Midwestern engineer Walter C. Baker understood the basics of carriage production. This background gave him faith that he could make the leap into car building. Teaming up with his family, his father-in-law and brother-in-law, he started the Baker Motor Vehicle Company in Cleveland, Ohio in 1899. Seeing the aforementioned advantages inherent in electric vehicles, Baker decided to place his faith in the electric powertrain. Sadly, in that year's Automobile Club of America speed trials on Staten Island, his car was involved in a disastrous crash. After crossing the one kilometer mark in just over 30 seconds, Baker and his co-driver lost control and crashed into a group of spectators. One person died at the scene and another died later from injuries. The drivers were both arrested and charged with manslaughter, but were freed when it was determined that the crowd had been negligent and had pushed past protective barriers and onto the course. Baker's innovative safety harness likely, likely protected the car's occupants from serious injury. 
Further attempts with two smaller single-seater race cars he named Torpedo Kid were also employed in pursuit of the land speed record, but were subsequently abandoned following another non-lethal spectator crash in 1903. Baker has often been noted as the first person to cross the 100 mile per hour barrier, although his records weren't official due to these wrecks. Given this peril, Baker decided to forego his quest for top speed. As gasoline powered vehicles increased in popularity and gained infrastructural support, he shifted his attention instead to diminishing the electric car's liabilities, particularly their limited range. He worked diligently on new battery designs, shaft drives, and other components. In 1910, his new chief engineer, Emil Grunfeltz, set a record for distance driven on a single charge, taking a Baker Victoria for a 201 mile trip at an average speed of 12 miles per hour. Not exactly incredible speed, but an impressive feat nonetheless. The rechargeable nickel, nickel iron batteries guaranteed you a 50 mile trip before needing to be recharged on average. Baker's successes gave the, comp the company prominence among the elite and the company capitalized on this publicity. In advertisements around 1909, the, bra the brand boldly boasted about the King of Siam owning a baker. The company made a similar splash in American politics when President Taft's administration purchased a 1909 Baker model as one of the White House's first automobiles. A steam-powered white and two gasoline-powered Pierce Arrows were also included, Taft hedging his bets on how the battle of the powertrains gasoline versus steam versus electric was going to play out. Taft later added a 1912 Baker Victoria that went on to be driven by five first ladies. The Baker brand maintains some celebrity allure today with car collecting comedian Jay Leno holding a 1909 model. As a means of, of offsetting some of the powertrain's inherent shortcomings, Baker made investments in battery charging infrastructure. The brand announced plans to open stations at every major intersection in Cleveland to charge vehicles and to grow the network from there, although this effort became cost prohibitive and never came to fruition. Again, the American government was not as eager to help inventors then. Expansion into the production of electric trucks, police patrol wagons, and even trucks and bomb handlers for the United States Army during World War I was not enough to fend off the rising dominance of the internal combustion engine popularized by Ford, especially after the pro proliferation of the electric starter, first available on the 1912 Cadillac, significantly increased safety and convenience. By 1915, the Baker Company was defunct. With declining electric car sales nationwide, Baker and its competitor Roush and Lang decided to merge. The Baker R&L Company was the result, though the firm became more popularly known as Baker Rawlang, as did the cars. The Baker name continued only through 1916. Electric cars were available from Baker in several body styles, including some with four doors, which was unusual for an electric. A choice of front or back seat steering was also available. The Owen Magnetic was produced in the Baker R&L Company plants from 1916 to 1919. During 1919, a total of 700 Roush and Lang electrics were built, and the company entered automobile coach building as Rawlang body division of the Baker R&L Company. Another department was set up to produce electric industrial trucks. The Rausch and Lang Carriage Company started in 1884 by Jacob Rausch and Charles Lang. Producing some of the best known and expensive carriages in Cleveland, the company entered the automotive business in 1903 by taking on the agency for Buffalo Electric and in 1905 offered an electric Stanhope of its own manufacture. 50 Stanhopes, coupes, and depot wagons were built in its first year. In 1907, Roush and Lang bought out the Hertner Electric Company, who supplied Roush and Lang motors and controllers. John Hertner became chief engineer for the Roush and Lang Automobile Department. American business at the time very, I don't think ever, outsourced its talent to India or China and was intent on hiring and keeping Americans. From 1907, the company made all parts of its car in its own factory. 
Production increased annually, but in 1911, Roush and Lang had endured being sued by the Baker Motor Vehicle Company for infringement of patents relating to the mounting of rear springs. In 1922, Roush and Lang entered the taxicab field following the success of British electric vehicles as taxis, with production of both electric and gasoline versions marketed under the initials of R and L. From 1923, taxicab production was the mainstay of the Roush and Lang production. The electric taxi did not sell nearly as well in the United States, and the electric passenger cars were produced only in handfuls by the early 1920s. From 1924, Roush and Lang was in financial trouble, just as Baker was years earlier. An extension of time was granted, but the firm struggled on for a while longer. Later in 1928, half of the Roush and Lang factory was leased to the Moth Aircraft Corporation as the United States turned its eyes to flight, and passenger car production ceased later that year. Shortly before the 1929 Wall Street crash, an experimental 60-horsepower gas electric vehicle was built at Roush and Lang in collaboration with General Electric engineers. It was sold to Colonel E.H.R. Green, son of multimillionaire Hetty Green. However, Green did not do much with the vehicle. The stock market crash later that fall precluded any possible plans of production, but the third hybrid built in 1930 is extant. The, com the company continued sporadic production of taxicab and coach work into 1932. Today, Biden is planning—President Bi Biden— is planning to transition the transportation sector to electric vehicles that are powered by lithium batteries and require other critical metals where China dominates the market. Mining and processing of lithium for lithium batteries, very few vehicles use the rechargeable nickel-iron batteries as they did in the past, is very environmentally harmful. There are a few lithium mines in the United States, notably in Nevada, but most are located in Africa, China, and Australia. In May 2016, dead fish were found in the waters of the Chinese Liki River, where a toxic chemical leaked from the Ganjiazhou Rongda lithium mine. Cow and yak carcasses were also found floating downstream, dead from drinking contaminated water. This was the third incident in seven years due to a sharp increase in Chinese mining activity, including operations run by Chinese BYD, one of the world's biggest suppliers of lithium-ion batteries. After the second incident in 2013, officials closed the mine, but fish started dying again when it reopened in April 2016. This is a huge contrast to mines in the United States which are closely regulated, almost to the point where they can't turn a profit. Lithium prices doubled between 2016 and 2018 due to exponentially increasing demand, including from the United States. The lithium-ion battery industry ex is expected to grow from 100 gigawatt hours of annual production in 2017 to almost 800 gigawatt hours in 2027. Part of this phenomenal demand increase dates back to 2015, when the Chinese government announced a huge push towards electric vehicles in its 13th five-year plan. This is reflected in American car manufacturers. The battery of a Tesla Model S, for example, has about 12 kilograms of lithium in it. Grid storage needed to help balance renewable energy would require a lot more lithium given the sizes of the batteries required, a lot bigger than the nickel iron batteries of the past. The lithium extraction process uses a lot of water, approximately 500,000 gallons per metric ton of lithium. To extract lithium, miners drill a hole in salt flats and pump salty, mineral-rich brine to the surface. After several months, the water evaporates, leaving a mixture of manganese, potassium, borax, and lithium salts, which is then filtered and placed into another evaporation pool. After about 12 to 18 months of this process, the mixture is filtered sufficiently so that lithium carbonate can be extracted. South America's Lithium Triangle, which covers parts of Argentina, Bolivia, and Chile, holds more than half the world's supply of lithium beneath its salt flats, but it is also one of the driest places on Earth. In Chile's Salar de, de 
Atacama, mining activities consumed 65% of the region's water, which had a large impact on local farmers and locals to the point that communities had to move to get water elsewhere. There's also the question about claiming property as one's own. We saw today that an American port was seized by the Mexican government, and so it's possible that these kinds of conflicts will increase as we see the demand for lithium increase over the next few years. In Tibet, there is the potential for toxic chemicals to leak from the evaporation pools into the water supply, including hydrochloric acid, which is used in the processing of lithium, and waste products that are filtered out of the brine. In Australia and North America, lithium is mined from rock using chemicals to extract it into a useful form. In Nevada, researchers found impacts on fish as far as 150 miles downstream from a lithium mine. Lithium extraction harms the soil and causes air contamination. In Argentina's Salar de Hombre Muerto, residents believe that lithium operations contaminated streams used by humans, livestock, and for crop irrigation. In Chile, the landscape is marred by mountains of discarded salt and canals filled with contam contaminated water with an unnatural blue hue. According to Guillermo Gonzalez, a lithium battery expert from the University of Chile, this isn't a green solution. It's not a solution at all. China is among the five top countries with the most lithium, and it has been buying stakes in other mining operations in Australia and South America, where most of the world's lithium is found. Chinese Tianqi Lithium owns 51% of the world's largest lithium reserve in Australia, giving China a controlling interest. In 2018, the company became the second largest shareholder in Society Dad Chimica y Minera, the largest lithium producer in Chile. Another Chinese company, Ganfeng Lithium, has a long-term agreement to underwrite all lithium produced by Australia's Mount Marion Mine, the world's second biggest high-grade lithium reserve. In Australia, only 2% of the country's 3,300 metric tons of lithium ion waste from batteries is recycled. Unwanted MP3 players and laptops often end up in landfills where metals form from the electrodes and ionic fluids from the electrolyte can leak into the environment. This is in contrast to the nickel iron batteries from the past, which were generated from mines in Minnesota and the upper peninsula of Michigan. These batteries also could be endlessly recharged, and when they were recycled, they were recycled into two materials that are very well known, nickel and iron. Because lithium cathodes degrade over time, they cannot be placed into new batteries. Researchers are using robotics developed for nuclear power plants to find ways to remove and dismantle lithium ion cells from electric vehicles, rising up the cost passed to the consumer. There have been a number of fires at recycling plants where lithium ion batteries have been stored improperly or disguised as lead acid batteries and put through a crusher, which is not permitted for safety. Not only have these batteries burned at recycling plants, but automakers are seeing battery related fires leading to vehicle recalls and safety probes. United States safety regulators opened a probe into more than 77,000 77, electric Chevy Bolts after two owners complained of fires that appeared to have begun under the back seat where the battery is located in those cars. Because manufacturers are secretive about what goes into their batteries, it makes it harder to recycle these batteries properly by local councils. Currently, recovered cells are usually shredded, creating a mixture of metal that can then be separated using different techniques, such as burning, which wastes a lot of the lithium and contributes to air pollution. Alternative techniques, including biological recycling where bacteria are used to process the metals, and techniques which use even more chemicals in a similar way to how lithium is extracted from brine, are being investigated. It is estimated that between 2021 and 2030, about 12.85 million tons of lithium ion batteries will go offline, and over 10 million tons of lithium, cobalt, nickel, and manganese will be mined for new batteries. 
China is being pushed to increase battery recycling since repurposed batteries could be used as backup power systems for China's 5G stations or reused in shared e-bikes, which would save 63 million tons of carbon emissions from new battery manufacturing. To date, the United States has no such plan and recycling remains somewhat a mess with different jurisdictions having different recycling rules. Cobalt is found in huge quantities in the, Demo the Democratic Republic of Congo and Central Africa, where it is extracted from the ground by hand using child labor without protective equipment. China owns eight of the 14 largest cobalt mines in the DR Congo, and they account for about half of that country's output. While China itself has only 1% of the world's cobalt reserves, it dominates in the processing of raw cobalt. The DR Congo is the source of over two-thirds of global cobalt production, but China controls over 80% of the cobalt refining industry, creating a bottleneck where raw material is turned into commercial-grade cobalt metal. Like lithium, the price of cobalt has quadrupled in the last two years and will likely increase as Biden imposes electrical vehicle requirements on the American consumer. Environmentalists worldwide constantly express concerns about the climate, land, air, and water pollution, but they should be worried about electric vehicles and renewable energy where lithium cobalt and other critical metals are needed to produce batteries. We have been able to produce electric vehicles before without such environmental impact. Why don't we return to the technology of the past? Mining, processing, and disposing of these metals contaminate the drinking water, land, and environment. And since China dominates the global market, it is the United States growing dependent and continuing to fall behind even though first successes of electric vehicles were seen in the United States.